Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. All right, great, y'all. Associated Press, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. We are ready for the event. Well, greetings. Buongiorno from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Jessica, I can't help but wonder if you're still pinching yourself. Does it feel like you're living a dream up there? And what are a couple of the biggest surprises you've encountered about living in space? Yeah, it absolutely still feels like a dream, and I, I just keep waiting to wake up. Uh, but I hope that I don't, um, because it is it has been absolutely awesome living up here, um, working with with my crewmates. Um, probably the the most surprising and most fun thing for me, or one of the most fun things for me, has been getting to learn how to work and operate in basically in three dimensions in a, in a full volume. And it's been so interesting watching how your brain so easily adapts to using all of the wall space and all of the volume um, so quickly. Well, well, for either or both of you, uh, women are still very much in the minority when it comes to space travel. Are there any adjustments you would make to the space station to better accommodate women? And I'm thinking of things like the NASA toilet that was built to better work with the female body. Have, have either of you tried that yet, and are there other things you might recommend? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, there, there's nothing specifically that, that comes to mind. Uh, we as a crew have not had a chance to use a uh, toilet, like the, the new toilet system yet. Uh, but the, the legacy one that I also used during my, my first flight just seems uh, to work uh, quite well. And uh, there's uh, certainly um, different adapters that uh, maybe um, work better for the female anatomy that are available here on board. So uh, it works quite well. Uh, what creature comforts in general might you add up there to make or, or make certain that if you had them that you would have with you on a moon or a Mars mission? And I'm thinking of things like the espresso machine, and might you fire that up again, Samantha? Um, what other niceties would you add to your, uh, to your uh, mission up there? So, yeah, the, the espresso machine, unfortunately, is not on board anymore. It was uh, deorbited uh, or um, uh, brought back to the ground a, a few years ago. Uh, in, in terms of the missions to Moon and Mars, I, I have to say that uh, you know we, we would probably have to adapt to uh, smaller size vehicles than than ISS, and uh, and, and probably also to having uh, less creature comforts rather than uh, more. Uh, but that's part of what we do here on ISS, right? Is uh, is to test uh, technologies and also concepts of uh, of habitation that hopefully will be helpful in, in those uh, missions beyond low Earth orbit, where we can still uh, you know, have what we need to, to, to survive and thrive as human beings, but probably using less resources and space than, than we have available here on, on space station. We often say that you know, it's, it's a little bit like a camping trip. You have to adapt. But I would say space station is definitely a luxury camping trip. And, uh, you know, a mission to, to the moon or even beyond to Mars uh, uh, would be uh, maybe um, less uh, lux luxurious in terms of uh, space and creature comforts. Well, both of you must be used to being yeah, outnumbered. And I would just. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please do. Oh, yes. No, I was just going to add that we certainly are spoiled up here on the ISS. Um, we are, we're living pretty good. We've got um, great snacks, great food, great company, obviously, um, and, you know, access to Internet and, and other creature comforts like that. So we, we definitely um, are, are living large. Well, um, both of you must be used to being outnumbered by men in your respective fields. Is it nice to have another woman up there with you? Um, and is it, do you think we'll ever see a woman majority space crew or even an all woman space crew? 
Yeah, it's certainly uh, a pleasure to be up here and an honor to be up here with all of my, my crewmates, including Samantha here. Um, and I'm certainly grateful for, for our crew and, and the, the crew compliment that we have put together. Um, certainly, I think in the future, um, we certainly have a, an increasingly diverse astronaut corps, um, both in the NASA Corps and then hopefully soon in the ESA Corps as well. Um, and so the, the possibilities in terms of uh, mixing and matching of crews um, is ultimately endless as we look towards the moon and Mars. Uh, well, you, while you have the mic, Jessica, I know you, you took some rocks up with you. By any chance, are they moon rocks? Uh, what rocks do you have, and have you pulled them out yet? Unfortunately, I don't have any moon rocks with me. They wouldn't. They wouldn't let me uh, <laughs> take those up here. They're too way too valuable, I think, and I, I wouldn't. They wouldn't be uh, safe safe in my hands. Um, but I do have um, a few other rocks, um, including a meteorite, actually. So kind of um, returning it back to its home, and then um, we'll bring it back down to Earth once again. Uh, so just excited about those those little little treasures that I have. And uh, Samantha, for you, um, I'm assuming you took up some Italian delicacies. Um, what are they, and have you eaten them yet? I do have some uh, some meals that have been prepared uh, for me by the um, uh, actually the same uh, chef that um, that prepared my meals in my first flight. Uh, they're not appear with me yet. They will uh, come on a cargo mission in uh, in a few weeks uh, from now. So I haven't tried them in in space yet. Um, but um, yeah, I, I've uh, kind of like on my first mission, I really focused on on trying to have uh, healthy, nutritious uh, meals. And then uh, maybe something uh, something special. Um, there's going to be also some snack bars that include some flour made from insects. So definitely not an Italian traditional meal, but uh, maybe part of what nutrition will look like in the future. Well, you're going to have to tell me more about this flour. What kind of insects? And and um, is this from some scientific lab in Europe? Oh, I have to confess, I don't remember the details off the top of my head now, but uh, I can definitely get those to you. Well, thank you. And, you know, there's a total lunar eclipse coming up late Sunday night, early Monday morning. That'll be visible throughout the Americas. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if you guys might be setting your alarm clock early to get up and see some of that. Yeah, we have de definitely heard about that and are hoping to. Um, hopefully we can get um, be up in time and, and be at the right place at the right time to, to catch a good glimpse of that. And, and uh, you know, with all the difficulties happening here on Earth, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, I know you're getting along wonderfully with your Russian crewmates, but are you avoiding the subject of Ukraine while you're up there? Is all that making for a rather awkward situation more so than might otherwise be? Uh, we certainly try to uh, focus on uh, on the mission before us and uh, and all the things that we have uh, we have in common. You know, our our passion for space, our commitment to this mission and to the space station program, um, but also you know all the, all the things that bind human beings you know all over the world. The the love for our for our families, for our children, for our friends, and uh, and that's what we cherish and celebrate together. Well. Um that's my last question. Uh, good luck to you both. Um, Godspeed, and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, that cargo ship won't be too late for you there, Samantha, with all your goodies. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Associated Press portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from ABC News. Station, this is Gina Sinceri with ABC News. How do you hear me? Hello, we have you loud and clear. We are ready for the event. So, Samantha, I think you have sent down the very first TikTok video from space. Tell me about your inspiration for that. Um, 
Yes, indeed. Well, um, as I was thinking about, uh, you know, com communication during this uh, this mission, which is my second uh, space flight, I was uh, thinking that I really wanted to reach uh, the younger generations, the teenagers, the young adults, and uh, I have been told they are to be found on TikTok, uh, so that's where I went. <laughs> So what was your TikTok video about? How did you design it? So this first video, of course, we're, we're going to do more about, uh, you know, the, the life on space station and all the activities uh, up here and maybe also answering questions of uh, that people have uh, posted on the platform. But yeah, this first video was uh, really a little bit of a, of a recap of uh, that uh, spectacular uh, launch night uh, that we had a, a couple of uh, weeks ago. So it, it was a way to share the highlights of, uh, of that uh, amazing day. Jessica, is it now game on? Are you going to have to kind of meet her standards on TikTok too? I, I wouldn't dare compete with her, but I have volunteered to help her out. So I can I can be a videographer or whatever is required for TikTok videos. <laughs> and we know you're one of the few geologists that have made it to the space station. Are you the only one, the second one? Do we know where you rank on geologists going to the space station? Uh, so I am definitely not the only one. Um, off the top of my head, uh, Drew Foistel, um, who is a, a member of the astronaut corps, um, and also um, ESA astronaut, um, is also uh, volcanologist. Uh, so I'm definitely at least the third, if, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple as well. But it is super exciting to uh, be up here and getting to see the Earth from this new perspective. Now, how will your ge geologist skills come into play on the space station, or is this rolling into research for when we go to the moon? Yeah, you know, for me, I'm I'm super excited about the opportunity to uh, see the Earth from the unique vantage point that the ISS offers. Uh, we have other assets in in low Earth orbit and on the ground, obviously, um, ways of of acquiring data and information about the Earth. But um, using that in conjunction with our perspective here on the ISS is something that's really exciting to me. And in thinking about applications to the Moon and eventually to Mars, um, there are a lot of analogs, analog features and processes um, that, that can tell us a lot about other planetary surfaces um, using the Earth kind of as a laboratory to understand other planetary surfaces. So I'm looking forward to doing a little bit of that kind of observation while I'm up here. And I want you both to answer this. How's the sleeping situation? Do you sleep better in space, worse in space? Is it hard to get used to sleeping there? Well, sleeping is actually one of my very few superpowers. Um, so <laughs> sleeping is, is not a real issue for me up here. Um, it's excellent to be able to, to sleep in microgravity. Yes, I, I have actually stopped asking Wadi how she slept because she just sleeps fantastically anywhere, anytime. So that is definitely her superpower. Um, I, I'm not at that level, but I'm also a pretty good sleeper, so I, I, I sleep quite well up here. And uh, I have to say that is something I, I, I missed, uh, that ability of, like, you know, when it's time to go to sleep and, you know, you feel yourself ready to go to sleep, you know, I, I, would, I will be in my... In my sleeping bag, maybe typing some emails, and then I will know, okay, now it's time to sleep, and I will just zip up my sleeping bag and close my eyes, sh turn off the light, and just let myself float and, uh, and, and doze off. And, and it's a fantastic feeling. I like it a lot. And I'd like you both to take a shot at this. Looking back at your 10-year-old selves, what would you have told your 10-year-old self about your chances of becoming an astronaut and what it would take? How would you encourage that 10-year-old that you once were? I'd like you both to answer this. Thing. 
Yeah, I think I would tell my 10-year-old self to continue to dream big. And the, the only way to ensure that you're not selected is to not apply. Um, and so for me, finding ways to, pathways that were exciting to me, ways to pursue my passion, opportunities um, that led me down that pathway, uh, finding mentors and teachers, instructors that helped encourage me along those pathways um, was what really enabled me to get to this point. So I would encourage my younger self and all uh, young people to do the same. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I would talk to my younger self, uh, just because, uh, I mean, it, it turned out all right for me. I did become an astronaut, and if you go back in time, maybe it's my science fiction readings, but <laughs> if you go back in time and, and you know, talk, start talking to people, you might mess with the timeline. <laughs> and so I might end up not becoming an astronaut, so I, I think I will just, you know, let her alone. <laughs> So, Samantha, you must be encouraged because in the latest ESA astronaut uh, application, many, many more women applied. What does that mean for diversity in space as we move forward to going to moon and other adventures? Yeah, that, definitely true. I mean, we we're very uh, excited uh, at ESA that indeed we get we got a well in general a huge response uh, from applicants all over Europe. We get we got more than I believe twenty five thousand uh, applications this time around. So um, uh, what three over three times more than back in uh, uh, in two thousand nine. Um, and also, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the percentage of women has significantly increased, and so we, you know, we, we are all confident that by the end of this year, uh, we will have uh, several new astronauts, and among them, certainly uh, also several um, new female colleagues, uh, which means that uh, you know th those young colleagues will be the ones who will lead the way uh, in in missions uh, beyond low Earth orbit, so to the moon, and uh, hopefully one day towards Mars. Uh, speaking of the moon, Artemis 1 may be launching this year. Are you kind of looking forward to seeing a launch from the space station going to the moon? Oh, absolutely. That would be so fantastic. Uh, we, we would have the best seat in the house. So we're super excited about all, all that NASA is doing with the Artemis program and taking this first huge step, um, their first giant leap, if you will. Um, we're super excited about it. And my one final question kind of has to do with climate change. We're in a big drought in the U.S., and one thing you've mastered on the space station that's quite remarkable is recycling water. What lessons can we learn from Earth on your recyclable systems on the space station? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely uh, an area where, uh, um, you know, research and technology development and demonstrations on space station can have uh, direct applications for for life on, on Earth. Um, you know, NASA publishes every year, like, a, a pretty thick list of, uh, of such spin-offs. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, some of those spin-offs uh, come from, just as you mentioned, our uh, amazing ability to close the loop on, on water recycling. I mean, I, I think we're pretty close to to 100 percent now uh, of you know being able to to recover uh, you know the, the urine, the sweat, all the humidity from uh, from the air, um, and so hopefully there are companies out there and startups that take those technologies and scale them up and and make them applicable to the challenges that we face on Earth, such as uh, climate change driven droughts. Thank you both very much. I appreciate your time. Godspeed. Thanks so much. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants from the Associated Press and ABC News. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.